From the iconic Corky and Lenny's Restaurant and Delicatessen in Woodmere, Ohio, we are the fabulous Boomer Boys. I'm Bob Snyder. This is Bruce Bogart, my friend since the fourth grade. And we welcome you all tonight, whether you're watching us on YouTube or here at Corky and Lenny's. And just as a reminder before we get going, because we've got a great guest tonight, we want to make sure we get all the time we can with him, is that Bruce, next week, we are going to have a little bit of a celebration here about something that's a, a big deal in Northeast Ohio, and that's the uh, Kane Park Summer Theater season. Right. Okay, anybody that's been in Northeast Ohio for any length of time knows some of the great talent that comes to uh, Kane Park. We have uh, a representative of Kane Park coming in next week to talk to us about what's going on. And here's, here's the best thing. This is why you want to definitely come to our show next week, because we are going to be giving away two tickets in the first five rows for the performance of Dionne Warwick, who will be here in June, and. and two tickets to Judy Collins. Two baby boomers uh, all time, right? So if you want your chance to uh, win those tickets, you'll have to be here in person for Kane Park. And uh, let's see, I think you may have the dates. Uh, oh, by the way, some of the other people they have coming in is uh, Air Supply. And um, Dionne Warwick, by the way, will be here on June 22nd. Who's going to be there August 1st? I don't know. I want to know. <laughs> I can't put up my glasses. I met, you know, I met my wife there on August 1st. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I remember, I remember that. Know. Oh, we were, we were definitely going to talk about it. It's $5 movie night, movie night, and the movie is The Goonies. Oh! How do you like perfect. the perfect, perfect night? night. Let's perfect get our night. All right. And Judy Collins, by the way, is going to be in the Evans Amphitheater August 10th. So we're going to be talking about that, giving away the tickets. They've got some other free things going on. But tonight we have with us a real legend in the radio business. And I'm, I'm a little nervous about this. I've, know, I've known about this fellow, I've read about him, and I'm really excited that Bruce was able to figure out a way for him to come here tonight and be our guest. And believe me, when you hear some of the stories that he has for us tonight, uh, you're gonna be very happy we had him as well. So uh, without going into any more of that right now, I'm gonna ask everybody to please welcome uh, the host of Sterling, on Sunday, Walter Sterling. Wasn't that difficult? I said, hey, you want to get out of the house on Tuesday night? How he said, I'll be there. You got him, OK. Watch the wires. Well, this is the hard part of the show. Why don't you stand here? I am? Oh, good idea. He's already given instructions. You can tell this guy was an executive at NBC and ABC. This is the only way you get to meet people unless you're having them deposed. Ouch. <laughs> well, everybody at this table knows about that. <laughs> Walter, welcome, officially. Thanks Thank for coming you. in. Thanks for we having appreciate me. Appreciate it. We're so happy to Thank have you. you. OK, I, this is really great as far as I, I'm looking at, uh, thinking about this. I love Howard Stern. I'm listening to Howard Stern on the radio a couple weeks ago. And Bruce is telling me about how he thinks he can get Walter Sterling to be on our show. And that morning, Howard Stern starts talking about you. And uh, I, you know, so let me tell you, it's great to have you. And Bruce, I know you know. Well, here's some the other... deal. I have mentioned your show to Bob, and you know, because Bob spent four or five years in the industry before his wife, first wife, told him he didn't want to do it anymore. Right. Okay, but it goes back a few years. <laughs> Bob thinks he knows everything, so I would tell him about you. And, okay, but once he heard your name on Howard Stern, calls me, Bruce, you son of a bitch, you gotta get him on the show. And that's the way it went. <laughs> so ask your questions, Bob, because I, I know it's like seeing an old baseball card. I get that. Well, How old? How old? <laughs> well, talk about old. You were the youngest, uh, tell me if I'm wrong about this, but the, the youngest talk show host in New York City to go on the air in a full-time show. That's right. Okay. How so, old were you? So I was 20 when I had a regularly scheduled talk show on FM in New York City. Okay. And then from that, you became one of the executives there, right? Then, Which is, that's unbelievable at, too. Yeah. And then at another company, I was a 26-year-old executive vice president at NBC. And no one's beaten that since. No one has. And then from NBC, you went to? Went to ABC. Okay. And I went from being an executive vice president to being a vice president. And that m matches the trajectory of my career. So now that I'm here with you, 
<laughs> so you're, peak, you're, you're peaking tonight. Yes. <laughs> That's what we're saying. You're peaking. Right. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so it was uh, always with radio, though, as opposed to broadcast television? Would, yes. Would you like to know why? Yes. All right. So Fred Silverman, the CEO of NBC, okay. Mr. Television, one time at, the, at a bar, said to me, why, why, why don't you go into television? What is this just radio? Why don't you do television? And it's like, if you say to somebody in radio, if you say that to a radio guy, you might as well ask him, why don't you become an airline pilot or a plumber? Because to people in radio, it's not a choice. It's an avocation. It's like being a priest. And it, the sex life is similar to being a priest. And <laughs> no, 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 no. Come on, you had your groupies. Come on. I had stalkers. Are those oh, groupies? Right, right. You, had, you had people. Look at you. Is your body always similar to what it is now? No, it was. It must it, have been thinner if you had stalkers. It was always. I've always had. A, just, you know, I've yeah. always had a body made for Brooks Brothers. Kidding me? Really? It was made for Brooks Brothers. And in fact, this is so embarrassing. Once I was walking down Fifth Avenue in New York City, and a stranger came up to me. This is Fifth Avenue, New York City. There are hundreds and hundreds of people on every block. And one a person comes up to me on Fifth Avenue, New York City, and says, sir, where is Brooks Brothers? <laughs> OK, that's, you know, it can happen. Two months later, I'm walking down Fifth Avenue. Another person comes up who I don't know and says, sir, where is Brooks Brothers? So yes, it's a body made for Brooks Brothers. Well, let me tell you this. <laughs> the only thing, only research I did, I Googled Okay, Walter Sterling Hidden Secrets. Yes. And I want you to, I'd love you to tell our, our audience a story about, I guess you, you, had to, uh, you came to a fork in the road, you had to decide between staying in Rome or getting a flight back. Let me finish his question, then I'll tell you. Because that guy here. He's but always I, interrupting but me, you'll me, get used to that. Let me, let, Jack, me, let me answer the question about radio. Everybody in radio views it as a calling. This is all they could do. You offer them jobs in TV, or in plumbing, or airline pilot, or roofing, and they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. So there was Mr. Mr. Silverman, Mr. Television, president of NBC, said, well, when are you going to go into TV? Why don't you go into TV? And I'm like, it, 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 it did not print. It made no sense to me. It was a crazy question, because I was in radio. That's what you do. That's what you do. It, and everybody in radio has the same pathetic story, which is you say, well, why are you in radio? You go. I got into radio when I, I, when I was 15. I hung out at a radio station when I was 15 until they let me do something. Everybody in radio has the same story. It's, it's interesting you're mentioning it. One of the people in our audience tonight is um, just going into college now. I don't want to embarrass her too much. And she, was, she's going, she wants to go into radio. And that's one of the reasons she came to watch the Fabulous Boomer Boys tonight. Because even though we're on the webcast, and we like to think we're sort of on TV, we're basically, our show grew up on radio 25 years ago when we did our talk show. So we'll have to introduce you to her later. So I'd you be can happy talk to, to meet them and discourage. But she's a little young for you, but I think you'll want to meet her. Yeah. No, OK. <laughs> All right. I mentioned Howard Stern. I, I listen. And Bruce did as well. Please give us a little bit about the history, the fact that People in the industry know this, but I don't think the average person here in our audience realizes. You were very much involved in getting Howard Stern to leave what they now call terrestrial radio and go into satellite radio. There was a moment when Howard was on the air, and uh, many of his affiliates were owned by Clear Channel Communications. And Clear Channel decided to put the lions at bay stopped the FCC from hounding them on many levels. And one of the actions they took was they said, we're canceling Howard Stern on all of our stations today. I'm listening to him that morning in, an, in a rage. He was in a rage about this. But the tone of the industry had gotten to the point where many companies were about to do that. And therefore, I felt it was time. I was consulting Sirius Satellite Radio at the time. I felt this was the moment to go to his agent and say, it's time for Howard to come to satellite. So you were actually an employee at Sirius? I was a consultant to Sirius, Consultant, yes. OK. And I went over there, and I said to his manager, I walk in, and his manager says to me, you're the only person I'm seeing today. And um, I didn't know if that was good or bad, but I was the only one he was seeing that way. And I laid it out. I said, it's time for Howard to come to Sirius. 
And I looked, at his, I looked at him, I said, and I'll tell you the key reason it's time. And he looked at me, I said, he will have his own bathroom. <laughs> and and, and it, he looked at me, he said, you can guarantee that? He yeah. did so. I said, I guarantee it. He will have his own bathroom. And if you listen to the Howard Stern Show, you know how important that is. It, it, was, it was far more important than it should have been. And so, <laughs> so what they did when they hired Howard, it was amazing what they did, because he had robust physical specifications as to what he needed to, to, to be there. And they took, this was in the McGraw-Hill building in New York City. These are huge floors. One quarter of the floor that Sirius Satellite Radio is on was leveled to the wall and rebuilt to his specs, including the private bathroom. Mr. Mr. Stern, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever meet him? That's a Many times. A nice guy in the real world? Couldn't be nicer. In fact, such a nice man that uh, my daughter is here tonight. And uh, he's the father? And yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> And, a, and you've seen our show before? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Wolf. And okay. a few years ago, uh, my daughters made the mistake of saying they wanted kittens. Oh, and boy. And then that, that week, I hear him talking on the air about he and his wife have cats, there are all these cats they have to adopt out, all these, his wife's obsessed with cats, Beth was obsessed with cats. So I wrote him an email when he was talking about this, that they had kittens they had to adopt out, and I wrote, I'll take those kittens. Ten seconds later, his wife calls me and says, do you want these kittens? you want them? I said, yes, keep them. I'll come pick them up. And so I drove for uh, four or five years uh, <laughs> to, to Manhattan, where most of you have never been, which is strange, and uh, drove four or five years to get to it. And this was the best part of the story. So I get to his apartment building, which is a high rise across from Lincoln Center, 30 story high rise. And uh, I said to the doorman, I, I need to go up to Beth Stern to get this cat. I'll go up to 27B. OK, so I go up to the 27th floor. The door opens. I figure, oh, it's going to be the Stern apartment. This will be a good day. I'll get to see Howard's apartment. No. No. The, uh, the door opens. It's Beth. And there's a giant studio apartment with unobstructed views of Lower Manhattan, unbelievable views of Lower Manhattan and Lincoln Center, and cat furniture. And the cats have their own apartment. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized that the 20, 28th, 29th, and 30th floor of the 30th story condo building is all his. Wow. And oh. the, the lowest floor has an apartment for the cats, the secretary, the chauffeurs, this, this, the guest rooms. And then the top two floors is the Stearns apartment. That's where they live. And that is a great view, because I'm going to say, my son used to live on West 65th and looked right out onto um, the, uh, the theater there. So that, that, that's, that's a great, great spot. But uh, well, he deserves it. The guy is fantastic. He's fantastic. I mean, you know, he, he, he deserves it. I, j moving on to some of these other people that you've worked with, and I think something that baby boomers can relate to. I believe you're the one that got Ringo Starr of the Beatles, which I have to say, I have millennials I've met, they don't know who Ringo Starr is. I mean, that's like mind boggling to me, but they don't. But anyway, Ringo Starr that did what, like a 24 hour marathon? Is that what it no, was? No, it was the 20th anniversary of the Beatles first hit in America. Okay. And I was at the ABC radio networks. And I knew that everybody would do retrospectives of the Beatles 20 years in America. Right. And I thought, well, that's dull. We could do that, but we, that's dull. What if I could get a Beatle to jock? What if I could get a Beatle to be the disc jockey alone, without an announcer, to introduce the songs he wanted to play and tell stories? And I thought, OK, John's dead. George, <laughs> we don't know if George can talk. Paul won't do it. I'll get Ringo. Okay. And I called up Ringo's manager, went to see him in LA. And uh, believe it or not, for a quarter of a million dollars, he did 24 hours. A quarter of how much? 24, a quarter of a million dollars. Oh, that was nice of him doing for that. Yeah. Well, his manager said he needed new drapes. <laughs> so, so he did 24 one-hour shows, and he played the songs, told his stories. And then, and then the last one was a live broadcast where he took phone calls. 
Oh, well, that, I, yeah, I would have loved to have been in New York to hear that. So that's like mid 80s, something like that? Yeah. Wow. Okay. And now, you know, I, I listen to Sirius when I'm in my wife's car. And, yeah. um, Does she let you in her car? Yeah. She, you don't drive it, though? No. No. Not, appro I, not I, appropriate. Yeah. Have you ever driven with Bruce? Let me tell you. Okay. You want to start talking about when you screw me in, in the 10th grade and I wasn't in the, allowed in your car the first night we all went out? Well, don't okay. hurt me, Bob. All right, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> now, so wait, I want to tell you, Herman, the guy Peter Noon does that something like that every Saturday afternoon. He's really good. Does that start with you? Is that you? I didn't do that one. No, I but, didn't but do that. Was it all because of Ringo and was it the same kind of thing? I don't think so. Okay. I, I'd love to take credit, but I don't think so. But I know what you can take credit for. What's that? And that is that the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame here in Cleveland yeah. has actual people from Sirius doing their shows from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, right? Right. When, when I visited the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame the first time, I realized they had broadcast studios right. that were not used. They were sitting there empty. I'm like, what? Yeah. And one of the secrets of Sirius at the time is they did not have the ability to broadcast live. And so I said, well, these studios can broadcast live. And what, you mean Sirius didn't broadcast they live? They did not, no. They did not have the ability. Oh, to. the ability, okay. They could Fair. not, they had built out like 30 studios. None of them could go on live. They all had to be voice tracked through a computer. Okay. It was a nightmare. Anyway, so it was beautiful, but a nightmare. That's an easy joke, isn't it? So <laughs> anyway, the, um, uh, the studios were there. And I said, well, what would it take to to do this. So we got naming rights at the Rock and Hall, Hall of Fame for Sirius Satellite Radio and access to their studios whenever they wanted. And they do regu they did regular shows there for a long time. Yeah, and, they, and it's again, it brings people in towards Cleveland. Now here's the next thing though. Your program, yes. which you're on, Sterling on Sundays, yes. is on how many stations? 90. Uh, roughly 90 stations, not on in Cleveland. No. Go figure. There's, there's a reason for that though, there's right? There's a reason for that. Now I have to clear that up. It's not a cute little show. This is a very serious, big deal radio show <laughs> that's on WLS in Chicago, KDKA in Pittsburgh, KMOX in St. Louis. So you can sit in a parking lot in Cleveland. And, and you can hear, hear, the, you can hear, hear those it stations. on multiple stations in right. your car, especially right. in the summer. Um, but it's not on in Cleveland. And the reason it's not on in Cleveland is the network that uh, the owners of the network I'm on, which is Westwood One, compete with the owners of the big talk stations in Cleveland. So okay. the dispute is competitive, and they're not going to do us any favor. That's a little bit like what happened with Stern. If you want to, uh, I think I can relate it to that way. When they, when the uh, Clear Channel threw him off, yeah. right, and he still wanted to be in other markets, so that's when some of the competitors of Clear Channel, I think, picked him up. And put him in the other in the markets before he went to satellite. With that, I don't uh, think that happened. he doesn't think so. Okay, I tried. But anyway, I, but tried. anyway, I have a. Let me go back to this bit about the Rock Hall. Yeah. All right. So I want to know: Do you feel more of a kinship to the talk radio ilk or to the rock and roll stuff? Because I got a question. I need to know, though. It's important. Oh boy. No, it is important to me, Bob. Well, okay. All right. I mean, where do you feel you fit it? Heart, soul, DNA. Training experience, it's almost all top 40. And then I've taken that knowledge about how to do a top 40 station and applied it to every other genre, including talk. Okay, so here's my question. And you help, you're instrumental in getting in, in a part of the growth of functioning of the Rock Hall here. Yes. Aren't you pissed off that they don't have it every year that the installation is here? The ball players will go to Cooperstown, New York, from wherever they live. Doesn't it piss you off that the, the rock stars are too big to come to Cleveland? I was shocked and stunned that it wasn't always here from day one. I was shocked what do you and think, stunned. Right? Yeah. I'm like, what? I was, I was amazed. I was absolutely amazed that it was news that one year it was going to start coming from Cleveland. I'm like, it isn't always from Cleveland? Yeah. How is that possible? Uh, so yes, and, and I'll tell you what else, I'll tell you what else, Counselor, about that, which is that, which is that, hi, Alan Freed said these words. Right. In 1952, in Cleveland, Ohio, a new form of music began, rock and roll. 
Okay, that recording exists. It's a pristine recording of Alan Freed saying that. And I have said to every manager in Cleveland, why isn't that in your top of the hour legal ID? Regardless of your format, you're running Rush Limbaugh, you're running classical music, every station in Cleveland should have Alan Freed saying, in 1952, a new form of music was started in Cleveland, Ohio, rock and roll. I'm like, why isn't that on the radio every hour on every station? By law, yeah. by law. I don't gotta tell you something. My work is done. <laughs> so let's talk about your show. There is a way yes. sitting in Cleveland to listen to your show though, right? Well, Outside yes. of being in a car. No, you can stream it from any one of the stations I, I mentioned. So if you go to WLSAM.com and click Listen Live, you can hear it. Okay, and, and when, when, do you do it? when do you do the show? I do it in Media Mumbai in the slums of American media at 10 p.m. on Sunday nights. Okay, and I know why you do it on 10 p.m. Sunday nights. Why is that? Well, I want you to tell me. But I, I have no idea. No, I... <laughs> Well, cause I because I think... Because if they said you have to do it every day at 3 p.m., I would do it. Right, but at 10 p.m. Yeah. is when... Okay, this is something I, it's not totally my idea, but people that are younger <laughs> put their kids to bed. They've got some free time, right? And if they're not watching Game of Thrones on Sunday night, what's on TV to Sunday night these days? <clears throat> you, you're, you've we, got a chance to grab the audience, just like when we started the Fabulous Boomer Boys on radio, we decided to go on 7 o'clock at night because we wanted to beat the prime time and we wanted to get people right after dinner when they'd get a chance. And I think when you do a show at 10 o'clock on Sunday night, you're able to get people after they're done with their whatever their weekend activities. They're sitting down, they're relaxed, and they're ready for some good fun and entertainment. You're allowed to tell them he's wrong. That's crazy. The, the, here's, here's when a radio show starts. You ready? Okay. When you get in your car. And it ends when you get out of your car. And if you're a genius, I can keep you in the driveway for five more minutes, if I'm a total genius. Okay. But there's no, there's no appointment listening on the radio. But about Game of Thrones, it came as no shock to those of us from New Jersey that it was written by a schlubby guy from New Jersey. Whereas, <laughs> whereas, the, whereas the rest of the world is like, did, it, did the, he go to Cambridge? Is he from London? No, he's from Jersey. Worse than that, he's from Bayonne. Oh, God. <laughs> now, if you look at a map of Jersey and you look at Bayonne, you know what you're going to see? You're going to see the Game of Thrones kingdom map. Because what is he surrounded by in That's, Bayonne? Oh, yeah, he's surrounded by the, the Bayonne Bridge. He's surrounded by Newark. He's surrounded Another by Another great city. Union. Yeah. The Newark River. Just think about that. The Newark, Newark has a river. And Brooklyn. Now, anybody who grew up in Jersey knows what Game of Thrones is about. What's Game of Thrones about? It's about not getting along with the neighbors. It's about, <laughs> it's about trouble with the neighbors. And so he was born steeped in the milieu of trouble with the neighbors. And Jersey doesn't do what you guys do. God, you're pathetic. What you guys do is you go, oh, you're fine. Oh, you're fine. And in Georgia, they go, oh, bless your heart, where they mean, oh, screw you. And, and in Ohio, they go, oh, you're fine. What they mean is, oh, you're screwed. In Jersey, the way it works is, if I don't like you, I look at you and say, you're screwed. There's no bless your heart. This explains so, my first marriage. So he knows. <laughs> he was so, married to a Jersey girl. Oh. So R.R. R. Martin knew, knows that world. He lived that life. He just put it in the Middle Ages. Is that what you're? He just put it on a on a it, during shoots that were way too dark at night. Oh, right. yeah, so yeah that, that battle scene. So I wait, heard. let's get back to your radio show, though. Okay? Yes. You're on Sunday nights. Yes. Okay. I know you're not playing music. No. You're, you're talking. Yeah. Tell us about the show, so people might want to go online or whatever they got to do to hear you. If I do it the way I hope to do it. And I don't always. But if I do it the way I hope to do it, the conversation I have on the radio is the same conversation we would have at the food court. I would talk to you about why the service engine light does not go off, 
It never goes up. I just went through $3,800 to get the service engine light to go off. 20 minutes later, like a bad cartoon, it came back on. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and we would eat bourbon chicken. Now, why does bourbon chicken only exist at the food court? If I go to Chinatown, there is no bourbon chicken. It, it seems to only survive in the food court. So we would talk about that and about uh, parent-teacher day, parent-teacher conferences, and uh, why my vision of hell, pure vision of hell, is having to take a vacation with my in-laws. <laughs> in, what's wrong with that? I can't walk around in my underwear, and I can't say whatever I want, being from Jersey. I have to do the, oh, you're fine nonsense. Now That's we're back right. to what? Now, he hit you with the jersey. Now the in-laws, I want to go and what happened in my first marriage. Please, I'm thinking about right. all the money I wasted in analysis. All I had to do was talk to you 20 years earlier. Oh, my God, I had known it all. Oh. So like this week, we talked about um, bad camp stories. Everybody talks about summer camp. Oh, it was wonderful. I met my best friend. We were in a beautiful cabin. That was not my experience. My experience was very different. I discovered the hell of swimming in a lake. Because in a, in a cold lake. In a cold lake, thank you. Because you know the, the challenge with a lake is finding the bottom, and that's not always good news. No. <laughs> you ever swim? I gotta ask you. Well, wait, you, you gotta tell though, Bruce. Bruce and I have trouble relating to camp stories because we're from South Euclid. We yeah. can go to camp. No, we went to the local park, you know, so, but we've sent our kids to camp. So in the Jewish community, the swimming pool, the cement swimming pool is a lake. That's as close as I got to a lake until I was, I've, in fact, I don't think I've ever been in a lake. I've been in that ocean, the ocean. Have you ever been in a real lake, Bob? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, lake Erie, I guess that Lake Erie is a lake, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm sorry to, sorry to interrupt you guys talking. Okay, yeah, that's all right. Do you have any questions? I'm done. Well, I got three minutes on the show. I got him in. <laughs> I think some of what you said here reminds me about something else that I, I can credit to you that said, what two best friends talk about is not trivial. That's okay. a very big deal. What two best friends would talk about at the food court is a very big deal. What you two talk about is a very big deal. And, and what I always said when I consulted radio stations is I said, okay, if two best friends would not talk about this, in the food court, why the hell would you put it on the radio? And if two best friends would talk about it, why wouldn't you put it on the radio? What I just said, it remains a revelation to my peers. And I'm, no, we're gonna talk about Mueller. Okay, one third of the country is flooded and suffering from tornado damage, and you're gonna talk about, what, Mueller? Excuse me, Grandma, grandma's 40 acres has been wiped away, and I don't see it on ABC, NBC, CBS, you know where I see it? You know where I see the best flood coverage? Fox News, where they have three reporters and crews out all day. MSNBC, I don't think, is aware that there are tornadoes, much less that it happened. But so that's what I talked about last Sunday. The first, the first half hour last Sunday, I had a meteorologist on and a KMOX St. Louis reporter on talking about the breaching rivers, the levees being breached. I didn't hear it any place else. Okay, so. Let me ask you this, because you're, you're the consultant, and, and, and we're looking to improve our show, okay? You were kind enough to tell me about how I should have asked my fourth grade teacher when she was name? on, Mrs. Allison. We knew her as Ms. Reibel, and I should have probably talked more, let her talk more about specific stories, right? As a, oh, Go ahead, Bob. Okay, you know, this is a therapy part. So now that, we're, now that you're the consultant here, what do you think about our idea here, what we do with the Boomer Boys? The fact that we are two best friends. What do you want him to say? About? Bob, you're a schmuck. No. <laughs> Come on. What do you want him to say? I want him to be our consultant. Tell the I truth. Want him we'll cut it out us. if we don't like it. I think you're brilliant to, to feed your audience. That's a good move. You'll always have an audience. OK. And, uh, <laughs> and you're welcome, Corky and Lenny's. No, but you know. It's, first of all, it's a great idea. Okay. And I was excited to come here and hear your fourth grade teacher. Bruce told me she was going to be here, that she had taught you guys when, you know, in fourth grade. I come here, she's sitting here, and she is, a, she is beautiful and a lovely woman. She clearly was a remarkable person. You could see it, you could feel it, you could see the energy, and then you talked. 
<laughs> is that singular or plural? And, and you. And, and, no, and no, no, I no. didn't get to hear it. So you, you started to tell, you, you'd ask her a question, and you'd say, so what was the most remarkable thing about me? And, 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 then, and then you answered it. And she's sitting there smiling, smiling, sweet as could be, lovely woman. I couldn't, but then you both asked her a mysterious question that you have to own. You both asked her a mysterious question that she never got to answer and you never explained, which was you asked her, when the change came, and what was it, East Solon? That's where I go to get my car. First. I don't know. It was his question. What was it? Just South Solon? Where was this? South Euclid. South Euclid. Okay, so South Euclid. When the change came to the schools, how did you feel? How did you adjust it? Well, there were two problems with this question. Number one, you never said what the change was. So I said, to this second, I don't know what you're talking about. They put in air conditioning? What was it, the change? <laughs> and the other thing is I never got to hear her answer, which I actually wanted to hear. Do you want to tell us what the change was? Uh, she left the school system, went to Orange. I had no idea that that yeah. happened. I, I thought we I thought we did talk about no. that. How uh, she left. You so mean where the back and, and, is? Well, I thought yeah. Yeah. The, I yeah, thought I was right. talking more about the change in when she was working at South Euclid as when she, the uh, as opposed to Orange. So I just didn't phrase it right. I, but I that, no idea what but this about. is why we Excuse need a consultant, me. Bruce. I want you to know I appreciate your candor. But he will call me tonight. I'm not taking a call. He will call me tomorrow morning. I'm not taking a call. When he calls me in the afternoon, I won't take the call. It's okay. a better show if you, and this is true, it's a better show if you two only talk here. And not during the week? Not during the so, week. So, yes. <laughs> I owe you big time. Think of Johnny Carson. Johnny Carson would not refuse to talk to his guests before air. He would not talk to his guests before air. This is unbelievable. I mean, this is this has been the best the whole, show. The of whole my life. show, the whole to show, is you two Catholic boys arguing with each other. That's right. And right. that only is going to happen if it builds up during the week. Oh, it's great. <laughs> I'm done. You can, Tyler, wrap it up. We're right, good. We can go note, out on a big note. On that note, we're going to ask you for more advice as the days go on. But I know one of the things I think we're all going to do is look uh, on our computers to hear Sterling on Sundays, yeah. starting at 10 o'clock, right? What do you think? <laughs> look, give us a couple of good stations that they should tune to on the computer. It's easiest if you go to WLSAM.com. I'll put the link on, the click on our page. Listen live. We'll put the okay, link on our so page. All of you, but those of you that are watching this program, please remember to hit the subscription if you haven't yet, and also the like button. Because as we've mentioned, for those of you that haven't watched this before, we are now close to 8,000 views. And, uh, and we're pretty proud of that. And, and uh, we're always looking to expand and so we can bring more national people onto our show besides just the local people. <laughs> but don't forget national. next week. But wait, next week. Kane Park will be here talking about Northeast Ohio and Cleveland Heights, and we're going to be giving away tickets in case you missed the beginning of the show to Dion Warwick and Judy Collins, two great stars for baby boomers that will want to see like second or third row seats at the Evans Theater. So you want to be here next week, 6 o'clock on Tuesdays, and you can watch our show Wednesdays at 8. Bruce, before He's, I say thank you, I want to you, say goodbye. I would like you to say Pretzels, goodbye. I hope you feel better. He's our security guard. He's not here tonight. I'm sorry you didn't get and to meet him. And I got to say, talking to you tonight, it's almost like you have Tourette's. You just go here, you go there. It's, I really say it in the best way possible. And I want to say this. I want to say this. Go ahead. You Walter, like, uh, how do you like hearing that? Walter, right? I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bob, see you next week. Okay. Everybody, he thinks I want to talk to him. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week.